I know you. I know uh, Ralph Berry for um, many years. We ran together, and he came to our shul a lot of times. We biked together. We biked together, and um, back in the days when I was exercising, and Ralph Berry is still exercising, uh, which is called a kavod. Um, In fact, I, I remember the first time we went for a bike ride out yeah. by Beitar, and you pointed Beitar out. I went, oh, Beitar, right. and launched Beitar. a whole lecture about Beitar. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and that's where, where uh, which is just what happens when you run around Jerusalem or bike around Jerusalem. It's like, oh yeah, 2,000 years ago, this thing happened, and the body's in decay, and that's where this prayer comes from. So it's, uh, when people say there's a link between Torah and land, and, you know, that, that's, uh, that's in fact uh, uh, a reality. So why you, um, you came from a family and you grew up in, I came from a family that was Zionist? Or, no. no. I came from a family that uh, my father was a completely secular Jew and my mother wasn't Jewish. Uh-huh. So you converted? Uh, uh, I was converted as a kid. As a kid, uh-huh. And, and and then you went through like life as a and with Jewish education of some sort, or you decided on that later. I on? had Hebrew school and a bar mitzvah, uh-huh. and after I was in a bar mitzvah, after my bar mitzvah you know, over the next twenty five years, I was in a synagogue exactly three times: once for my uh-huh. brother's bar mitzvah and twice for weddings. Uh huh. And what happened that you got the you caught a bug of some sort, some sort of virus? It's uh, my ex wife Lori's fault. Really. Yeah. Oh, that's. I've heard stories like that. There's a guy at uh, one of the, one of the Litvak yeshivas yeah. here, whose secular girlfriend, in college, said you have to get into Jewish studies. Like you have to learn this stuff. He said, oh, okay. She didn't. She know it with us. It wasn't. It wasn't her, nudging at all. It was. Uh, uh, rather, when we got married, and she wasn't Jewish at the time. Uh, she decided we should get married by a rabbi because I was Jewish, and I didn't care. You know, the time before that I got married was by a minister from the Church of What's Happening Now. And What's happening now? <laughs> right. Is that really? You know, like a hippie. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Thing, yeah. You know. Um, and so, I, yeah, that's fine. So she turns to R in the San Francisco phone book for rabbi, finds the San Francisco Board of Rabbis, finds a rabbi who would do an interfaith ceremony, and, you know, he married us, and the... Uh, uh, we had an Alfruf the week before. We went to his synagogue, and it was Parshat Shof team. And she's a lawyer, and all of this legal stuff was like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> and uh, yeah. she decides she's interested in Judaism, and, you know, she drags me to these interfaith family things, and, and she decides she wants to convert. And I had nothing uh-huh. to do with that. It really made no difference to me whatsoever. Uh-huh. But she decided uh-huh. she was interested in it was something she wanted to do for herself. Mm-hmm. And I figured, well, I, you know, so she had to read half a dozen books, meet with a rabbi once a week. And I said, well, I better read what she's reading or she'll yeah. know more about Judaism than I yeah. do. And yeah. that'll be embarrassing considering I had the bar mitzvah and everything, yeah. right? Um, uh, which was, uh, my bar mitzvah was in a Orthodox synagogue in the Bronx that my grandfather helped establish. And, uh, uh you know, she went through the process, she converted, and over a period of about a year, we, you know, took on uh, following the mitzvot and stuff like that, and yeah. got active in a synagogue. I was on the board, and, you know, they, uh, I was chair of the Religious uh, Practices Committee for a while, and uh, what, I, what I tell them is they, they asked me if I wanted to be president of the synagogue, and I said, no, if you want me to work that hard for the synagogue, you're going to have to pay me, so I went back to school to become a rabbi. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh-huh. But the, 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 the bottom, and, and what's the, is there a link between um, the Jewish stuff and the, and, um, the land? Or is that something that was, was taught, or was that, because I know in certain um, branches of Judaism in America, it's like, uh, even, in, and even in Orthodoxy, there are people who say, you know, the, the, um, that the land is... Uh, is, has nothing to do with it. It's not the even though we, uh, we it was given to us uh, in the biblical narrative uh, by God, and that we have our whole history here, and we were here for thousands of years, and all of that. That times have changed, and um, just like uh, the American Indians uh, don't have possession of the land of the United States, uh, so you know we don't have we don't have any need to to own Israel. 
Is, what was what was uh, was there a link or well, how did it's, it's not mm -hmm. it's it's not that we have to own the land in Israel to to be Jewish. Obviously, we don't. Right? We had you know two thousand right. years of living in right. in, uh, in exile. But the but you also could look at it and say, well, why was it that the Jews were able to come back to their land after you know being gone for two thousand years? And it's because the rabbis built a connection to Israel and to the the Jewish religion. Right, and Judaism mm -hmm. wasn't a religion until after the destruction of the temple, really. Right? right, I mean, we were people were just Judeans. Um, so, and 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 at that point when the temple was destroyed, was where I, I think Judaism and Christianity went in different directions. Right, so the the Christian approach is kind of like what you were talking about, where they said, oh, the physical place isn't that important. Mm -hmm. And the Christians came. Yeah, that's up interesting. With this I never idea. thought about that. The Christians they, came up with yeah. this idea of the heavenly. Jerusalem and so Jerusalem, on, and right. they separated from the physical place. And the rabbis built in all of these reminders of Israel, right? In our, in our weekday prayers, three times a day, we're praying yeah. that all the Jews should be brought back together in Israel. Yeah. Um, at every wedding, we, we break a glass, which is supposed to be a reminder of Jerusalem broken. We're, you know, we have all these rituals. Our, our Shabbat dinner table is, is an altar, um, and we're priests. I mean, they... they they intentionally well, built in connections. Well, but even before the rabbis, uh, you know, the whole thing about coming to Israel, that was built into the origin story, right? Um, right. The whole thing about, I mean, I, you can fill it in, but, you know, back before with uh, Abraham, they get to get, was he promised the land, and then Joseph or Yitzhak were promised the land. Uh, there's a lot of promises that go in. Right, there's a lot of, there's a lot of promises through. in the land and so on, and you know, but, but the, the important thing was that, and we have, of course, the Shalosh, Shalosh Regalim, uh, which were three pr pilgrimage festivals when yeah. people were supposed to come to the to the temple in, in Jerusalem. But the, you know, God giving the land to Abraham doesn't give us rights to the land today, right? I mean, what gives us rights yeah. to the land today is more, you know, what the UN decided in 1947 and so on and so forth. Right. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Bible doesn't give us a title. Well, like, uh, you know, a lot of people, like uh, Yuval Harari most famously says that we live our lives according to, and it's, I think it's, a, it's clear to be accurate, we live our, live our lives according to narratives, right. according to stories. So if you have a story that's been going on for what, a few hundred generations, and it's managed to, uh, one of the, I'm, I'm listening to a lot of books about the origin of life these days. Mm -hmm. And one of the definitions of life is the ability to reproduce itself, which is mysterious because in this book it tells about how a lot of um, molecules are able to reproduce themselves, hmm. um, but uh, that are not even organic molecules. So if, um, if that stream of, let's say, um, narrative DNA, let's say you think of DNA as a, as a book, if that stream of narrative has been consistent since minus four thousand years, about. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, doesn't doesn't that get a sort of? Um, I mean, in the in uh, in the art world, they call it provenance. You know, a sense of or in, in Judaism they call it yichus, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, entitlement through through ancestry or through a consistent narrative or a consistent physical uh, uh, cor correlative correlatives to a spiritual story or to a to a other a story of any sort so if anything gives um, a, a sense of uh, belonging and a sense of possession um, historical narrative and that's also what every country has done whenever they've um, um, whenever another country has whenever a country's been invaded um, by another country um, um, uh, I, they always come up with like an, an, uh, a heritage of, um, and usually it's a, liter a literate heritage of books and other documents to show that they were there before and that they've been there for a long time. Um, and of all the countries of the world, it seems that, um, that the Bible and the fact of the continuity that was created by the rabbis or were, let's say, not even created, but was um, recreated uh, by the rabbis, um, is, you know, is a sort of entitlement. 
Um, I, I disagree with calling it an entitlement. Uh huh. You know, because but, because you know, in the modern world, um, you know, if you go by that, the Native Americans should be entitled to throw all the you know European invaders. Right. Right. Them, right. Okay. Right. So, right. And that's and, 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 and you're you're in Canada right now. Right. And it's and been a big issue in in Canada. It's a big issue, especially in Montreal, right, yeah. where the native uh, the natives tried to throw out the Canadians a while ago violently. Right. And apparently, uh, to this day, as of the last few years. Uh, every opening of every ceremony, maybe even every lecture at University of Toronto, um, they have a statement of apology and entitlement um, saying, uh, we, I, I, I shouldn't laugh or even smile about it, but um, uh, saying that um, we apologize for the, the fact that we brutally uh, and unfairly took this land over and possess it, possess it now, and we wish to give honor and credit to um, our uh, noble, you know, the noble savages. That's not the right uh, reference, right. but you know, we to to the people who were here before us. Right. And so Canada is like big into that. Not this. I I don't know if they actually enact any of that in any um, real ways. Um, certainly, no ways that are going to aside from putting an apology at the beginning of every lecture. That they don't have any. They don't like give a third of their land or a third of their wealth to, right. or any major portion uh, to the native, what are they called, the native people? In, in Canada, they call them the First Nations First people Nations, or, yeah. yeah. But, you know, we, uh, but, but the thing is, we are still different than colonizers, because colonizers are like the Belgians go to the Belgian Congo. They had no connection to the... Right. You know, to the Belgian Congo, they were there strictly to extract resources yeah, and things like right. that. Which, you know? which, whereas, yeah. whereas we have had a historical connection. It is, as you said, built into our spiritual DNA. So we feel right. a connection. And we're not going any anywhere else from, from you know, many of the Jews who came here. Um, you know, there is no other place for them to go. They're not going to go back to Morocco or Iraq mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Poland. And yet, I mean, to throw a, a fly into the ointment, uh, and yet there, people have said that there are uh, a variety of um, descriptions in the Bible of the borders of, of Israel. Right. Some of them going all the way up to uh, Iraq. <laughs> yep. Right? Yep. And, um, and so the question, one question is, like, what determines when something belongs to the land of Israel? And there's another statement, which I want to introduce right away is that they say that at the end of time, whatever that means, like we're at 5,700 and mm -hmm. something now, and um, at the end of the 6,000 years, um, the rest of uh, the world takes on the holiness of Israel, and Israel takes on the holiness of Jerusalem, and all of Jerusalem takes on the holiness of the, of the Temple Mount. So, so one question is, what will make that stuff into Israel, aside from some undetermined sense of holiness or presence of, um, you know, sense of the presence of God, like what makes something uh, into the land of Israel? Is it the presence of a majority of Jews? No, I mean, the, you know, it's an interesting question about what the, what the borders were. So yeah. a few years ago, uh, I helped come up with the rules that uh, the conservative Judaism uses for certifying wineries in Israel. Um, and there are certain mitzvot that are tolui ba'ars, that are dependent on the land. Mm -hmm. But, you know, where, where are those boundaries? And, yeah. and so it's like everyone would agree that... And that's you, not just the conservatives, you, the orthodox have, you the have a, yeah. If you have a winery in Beersheba, yeah. um, it's in the land of Israel and you have to do the mitzvot to depend on the land. If you yeah. have a winery that's in a lot that's outside the land, you don't have to do any of that stuff. But I was working with a winery that was a mitzpah ramon, and Mitzpah Ramon, turns out, is in sort of a doubtful area. And so what they do is uh -huh, they, they uh -huh. do some of the rituals, like separating truma and so on, but uh -huh. without a bracha. Uh-huh, wow. Because it's a, in an area... Have you checked the correspondence? Like, when you come up with a sock for conservatives... Do you check the psaks? Of, I'm sure you do. Um, you not only check the story. For me, it's oh. not a, not that it's a psaq for conservatives. I'm, I'm doing a. I'm a rabbi. I'm, you're a rabbi doing a psaq. Anybody yeah. wants to follow the living follow like, it. I've heard, doesn't I've, want to doesn't follow. Right, right. It, you know, I've, uh, I've even heard. Um, kind of like you think about this. I've even heard conservatives say 
that the authentic, you know, the conservatism is more, is in, in a sense more authentic. Oh, absolutely. Um, because it's more dynamic. Because yes. it's because, because what happened in the Orthodox world was about 150 years ago, mm -hmm. um, they felt threatened by all the change that was happening with the reform. And, mm -hmm. and the response, I think it was the Chofetz Chaim, who said, Kol Chadash Asur Min HaTorah. Right? right, innovation is forbidden by and the Torah. That wasn't in that, that was kind of a, biblical that's an thing. Innovation. That's, that's yeah. an innovation. It yeah. was never the case before that innovation was yeah. forbidden by the Torah. That uh -huh. was a reaction to the scary way the world was changing and stuff. Um, you know, but if you look back more historically, the Jewish world has always been pluralistic. They've accepted multiple opinions, different halachic approaches, and they innovated when necessary. There are a lot of things the rabbis put in place because they believed it was good for the Jews. Right. right? So, well, so hopefully, hopefully everything, like the, some of the prohibitions on, uh, uh, on eating and drinking with Gentiles. They put those in place because they believed it was good for the Jews. Right. And uh, the, uh, uh, in the conservative world, we're still willing to ask that question. Well, what's good for the Jews today? Right. It's not necessarily what was good for the Jews 2,000 years ago. Um, and in halakha, you can often, you know, there's a thing in the Talmud, any, you know, any, any rabbi should be able to come up with 101 ways to say that the worm is kosher. Right. Right. So you We're can argue, eating the worm. you can argue, yeah. uh, most halakhic issues, either l'chumra or l'kula, to be stricter or to be more, more lenient. Mm -hmm. And which way you should rule, uh, I think for me, ultimately comes down to is what's good for the Jews. Right. So then that's, a, that's a, an amazingly important question uh, and brings around the question of what is a Jew and, um, and the whole thing that now the current government is, is throwing that, um, those irons back in the fire to, uh, to redefine what kind of conversions are acceptable. Right. And, you know, and historically, um, they're... Like conversion was, I want, was the extent of it was like Ruth, like I want to be, I want to go where you go and do what you do. Right. Right. And apparently that, that mode of conversion was in place like for a long, long time. You, 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 can, you can still see yeah. that, by the way, with the Samaritans. So, uh -huh. so last, uh, in, uh, around Pesach time, I visited the Samaritan community, um, you know, and they're in, by Har Bracha. Uh -huh. And it was very, very interesting. And to the north? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, above Nablus. Uh -huh. um, they, uh, they don't have a mechanism. What's, for the, what's the Hebrew word for Nablus? Shem. Shem, okay. All right, so they don't have a uh, mechanism for conversion. Uh -huh. uh, they had some Italian guy who fell in love with the community, just wanted to become a part of it. Yeah. They don't have any ritual for him. They just, you know, he hangs out there and eventually says, yeah. yeah, you're one of us. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, it's exactly like Ruth. Right. Um, and this is another area where in Israel the Rabbanut is making making up halakha, which in my opinion there's no basis in halakha for the way they do it. Because if you look at Rambam, uh, it, it very explicitly spells out you know what the pr process is for uh, conversion, and it makes it sound like you do all the education in an afternoon. You teach them some of the major mitzvot, some uh -huh, of the minor uh -huh. mitzvot, uh -huh. you know what the rewards and punishments are, and you uh, you know ask him the questions in front of a bait den. If yeah. it's a guy, you do a circumcision or hatafat dam and hatafat dam is the the blood letting. Yeah, the, from take, the... take him to the mikvah. And, yeah. and boom, you're done. And Rambam explicitly says that even if the wish, witnesses were not kosher, vidiyavad after the fact, the, the conversion is still kosher. And so when they go around and do things a lot, like there was a thing that had some. Uh, what was it, Rabbi Dreckman? They wanted to nullify a bunch of his conversions. There's no basis for that. Who just passed away, right? Right. There's just, no basis mm -hmm. for that in halakha. You know, once a conversion's been done, even if the witnesses aren't kosher, right? The the conversion. Well, so it comes back to the same question of like, sorry to keep coming back to it, but it's uh, I'm obsessed with it these days. Is a definition of life and origin of life and the ability to reproduce, right. and uh, and part of the the, is, the question of re reproduction is uh, creating a border um, between oneself or what and the other, right? You know, and so how do you? That's you know, if you're going to so you can say that the or, like the rabbis, they're let's say what, what does it mean to be good for the Jews? It means that their particular type of Judaism 
will be preserved and reproduced. Right. Yeah. Right. And, you so, know, the, it, a lot of it's about continuity. And in different communities, the answer, you know, may be different. And, and so every community right. defines its borders differently. And something a lot of people aren't aware of is there are ways in which the reform are stricter than orthodox or conservative. Like? So according to, and I, I recently read the, the reform papers on this. So, so the reform definition of who's Jewish says if you have one parent who's Jewish, and it doesn't matter whether it's the mother or the father, uh -huh. um, and the kid is raised Jewish, the kid's Jewish. If you have uh, one parent who's, you know, one or two parents who are Jewish, and the kid is not raised Jewish, the kid's raised another religion, uh, they would, by their halakha, the kid is not Jewish. Even wow. if it's the mother who's the parent, they would still uh -huh. say the kid's not Jewish uh -huh. and uh -huh. would require conversion. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. there's a way, there are ways in which they're stricter. Well, but they do. It, it's, it, it's, mm. For me, it's not necessarily strict and more lenient. It's, it's, it's the way they're choosing to define the right. borders, the boundaries in their community. Everybody's got boundaries. Right. Right. Um, okay, so let's get, you know, get into that, that question of... Um, um, well, it's, it's an interesting question because also the halacha, the Jewish law that um, pertains to all the Jews is according to the rope. It's according to the majority, mm -hmm. right? And so when you ask an Orthodox rabbi, like, which majority? And they say, oh, the Orthodox majority. Right. So <laughs> it's, again, it's all about, um, uh, I'd be curious to know, like, who the most authoritative, um, if there's anybody um, that, ha I don't think there is. There's no one. Who, there's no one there's that no one. really it's, is embraces everybody and is embraced by everybody. There is um, Yeah. You know, and, and you know, it, it makes me sad in a way that the notion of Klal Yisrael, that, you know, all of Israel is one, is, 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 is a fiction. It is a fiction. Right? Well, we, no, uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, and this is something that uh, Rep Steinsalt said, um, he, he came to our shul for a lecture, to Ms. Merla David, and um, it was the time when some of the Sephardi girls were being um, not admitted to some of the Ashkenazi shuls. Right. And uh, somebody lobbed him the question of, well, what do you think about that, Rav Steinsal? So fully expecting him to say, it's an Asson, Am Yisrael Chai, Klal, right. you know, this is, it's, we're a group. And he said quite the opposite. He said, well, it's good that there are different groups of Jews and that they maintain uh, their self-definition. Right. So, so and that's another thing is like to, to get to like we in Judaism we I think probably every religion has a concept of oneness, of unity, and but the fact is in order to determine that something is has unity, it's a unity of 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 disparate parts. Right. Otherwise, there's no if if there's unity without a border and definition, it's hard to call that unity. Right. So yeah. so so. You know, we, and, and in a lot of ways, we have the same situation that Christians have. You know, there's, yeah. there's Christianity, and then you got the Catholics, the Protestants, the Baptists. You got yeah. all these different flavors. Yeah. Right. And and if someone who's a Baptist wants to be a Catholic and and take communion, they have to convert. Right. Right. It's just, but they're still Christian. No. But if you want to be Catholic and take communion and be part of that community, you have to convert. So it's it's really the same thing by us because someone. Yeah. You know, who does a reform uh, conversion and then decides they want to live in an Orthodox community has to do the conversion again. You know? Right, right. And it's because if they want to be accepted into that community, you have to follow the rules of that particular community. It's like Yisrael Campbell, who's had three conversions. At least, yeah. I think maybe even four. No, it's three. Three, oh, yeah. He had reform, conservative, conservative orthodox, orthodox, yeah. I, I met him when he was in his conf He didn't have reconstructionist stage. also? <laughs> no. Because there's a different branch of... Uh, uh -huh. Um, yeah, conversion. And uh, so I wanted to pop into this, uh, it's related to this general subject of uh, Rav Riskin. We once went to the airport and we saw Rav Riskin, who's mm -hmm. the founder of Efrad, well-known. He brought over his whole community. He's one of, the, one of the first modern rabbis, I think, who brought over, who had a strong community in, in America or out of the country. And he, he corralled them and brought them over not by force, I think. Well, you can bring everyone from not all of them, you know, but a good, the, you know, like 20, 30 families or, or whatever. Families or whatever. Yeah. So, um, um, so I had heard a rumor that um, I don't know if we can extract any principle 
or wisdom out of this, but somebody will find it interesting. Uh, I had a rumor that uh, John Lennon and Yoko had been coming uh, in, the, in the time before he was killed, had been coming um, to Rav Riskin in for Jewish you know, classes. Mm. And so I, I yelled out to him um, at, at the airport. I said, um, is it true what like they say about you and, and John Lennon studying with you? He says, oh, you mean taking conversion classes? <laughs> and I said, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so and what did like, he say? <laughs> he said, no, he said, yeah, he's the one who said conversion classes. I didn't, I didn't right. know it was conversion classes. So that's pretty, I mean, I don't know. Considering he's the one who wrote, the bat, uh, wrote about saying, imagine a world without any religion. Yeah, so, that is interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you came around, but you, uh, for all this, uh, so, so how did you end up in Israel? Like, what's the story? Like, so we, uh, we lived in Israel for a year when I was a student uh, in rabbinical school. Uh, so I was 2000 to 2001. Uh -huh. So we were here for the uh, start of the Second Intifada. In fact, I had ringside seats to it. Lori and I were on uh, the Mount of Olives working as extras in a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie no way. on Erev Rosh Hashanah that year when the riots broke out on the Temple Mount and all the shooting started and they had to, wow. they had to suspend the filming of the violent action movie because of the sounds of real gunfire. Gun <laughs> that is crazy. So, so we were here for a year and, and we really loved it. We, we loved this, the year here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we this, loved what was the year, year approximately? It was 2000 exactly? to 2001, uh -huh. right? And so when we arrived, it was also, there was all this hope in the year. Oh, that there was were the, the meetings with Clinton and all this sort yeah. of stuff. The that was like was a violent, happen. yeah, that was the year that my mother permitted us to move the Kef office to our basement yeah. um, because there were explosions every other week. Yeah, no, I, and we were yeah. living in... And Katamon, and I'd be trying to study at night, and you know, eleven o'clock at night from Katamon, I could hear the, the the tanks and machine guns oh, between yeah. Gilo and Beit Jala. That's right. It was and, really in, interfering with my studies. That's right. <laughs> um, that's what my father-in-law was visiting at the time. Oh, Shalom, and he said, like, What's all that noise. Right. And he said, I said, well, it's uh, tanks and heavy machine gun fire right. from, from Gilo, which yeah. is like you know a mile and a half from here, <laughs> yeah. right next to Be Bethlehem, Bethlehem. Yeah. So. That was an interesting time. Yeah, it was an interesting time, but we, mm -hmm. we still fell in love. We loved living here, and uh, our youngest, Devorah, uh, was born here. Who, uh -huh. She recently got out of the IDF. Um, and we, uh, that was my third year in the program, and, and then uh, uh, after I was uh, ordained, I went into doing pulpit work for five years. And I, actually, my first pulpit was in Canada, in Vancouver. Then we were in Toledo for three years. And uh, after three years in Toledo, the congregation approached me about renewing my contract. They wanted to renew my contract. And mm -hmm. uh, Lori and I had a conversation of, well, <clears throat> do we want to stay here in Toledo until I retire? Or do you want to do these th this thing we talked about of making Aliyah? Mm -hmm. So it was Toledo or Jerusalem. And somehow Jerusalem went out over Even Toledo, though Toledo Ohio. Is that, isn't that some biblical name figure. or something? I think it's a New <laughs> Testament uh, city. But, yeah. But the, the incentive was, was really a couple of things. One is uh, the modern state of Israel is the most exciting thing to happen to the Jewish people in 2,000 years and want to be part of it. Um, and the other thing is if you're a religiously observant Jew, it's just so much easier here where, right. you know, and like, like in places like Toledo, the, mm -hmm. you know, the kids want to, you know, participate in things like ballet or whatever. And, you know, the recitals are on Shabbat and, their friends have birthday parties on Shabbat that are too far away to, to walk. And, you know, just a lot of things that are more difficult. Going to the grocery store and having to scrutinize the, the labels. And, you know, here you go to the grocery store, you can buy anything. The, the dance recitals aren't on Shabbat. And, and our holidays are, are the national holidays. People don't have to worry about uh, using up all their, their vacation because they have to take time off for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, mm -hmm. etc. Um, it's just such an easier way to live an organic Jewish life. For me, it's really the way Jewish life was was designed to be lived. Right. Um, right. That's what uh, one of the members of our congregation says. He says, and he grew up religious. He says, like, he thought growing up that if it wasn't difficult, it wasn't Jewish. Right. 
And, right. In fact, after we made yeah. Aliyah, the first year after we made Aliyah, we, uh, uh, you know, we, we went traveling during Pesach and we were able to go places and eat out. And there's all these kosher for Passover foods and restaurants and stuff. And the kids said, Dad, this is too easy. It doesn't feel like Pesach. <laughs> right, right. So is uh, I told somebody yesterday who was in a um, difficult situation uh, and kind of uh, saying, like, why am I not married and why don't I have kids and why don't I have a job and why don't I have an education? He was like 40 years old. He said, well, it's, you know, it may be that you're uh, like avoiding difficulty. Mm. Like uh, maybe you like you're you're uh, So the point that what I'm grasping for is. Uh, is the place of difficulty. Um, in uh, in Judaism in Judish kite and and then to take it a step further uh, is the place of suffering mm -hmm. um, you know is that something that you do you think um, you're implying that and a lot of people say like life in America is so much easier because right. people are more polite or the lines are more uh, linear right uh, and um, but um, and you're saying that there's many ways in which uh, it's easier in Israel, so right. It's, yeah. but it's it's both. There are things that are easier, and there are things that are harder. Right. Um, so my question is, and then, and then also I'm taking I'm I'm uh, riffing on uh, another podcast, uh, Andrew Huberman, who talks about you know like the big fascination with uh, dopamine these days, mm -hmm. and uh, dopamine is the is the enzyme that. Um, engages people in a challenge mm -hmm. and engages them to, to confront the challenge and and uh, he said that the way to deal with um, challenges and the way to deal with dopamine because we're in a the, the modern world is so full of things that can addict people to easy dopamine hits and mm -hmm. raise their tolerance so that they're you know that it's not enough to just play games of murdering many people you have to go out and actually murder many people right. Uh, he, he said that um, the way to do it is to uh, value uh, the difficulty mm -hmm. uh, in it, of itself. Um, and so, and, they, and I've heard that said about uh, Jewish practice as well. It's like the more difficult it is, like if, you ha if there's a particular mitzvah that is, you find challenging, then you engage that mitzvah. And right, and so that, that works for some people, and that, that also explains why some people take on a lot of humrot, a lot of stringencies, right? Right, Because they, you know, if, if, if it's easy to do, you can do it on autopilot. Right. So, and right. the goal of mitzvot is to raise your God consciousness. If you're doing it on autopilot, it's not raising your God consciousness. Well, so that's one day, whole, yeah. they, they you can tighten that up, is to become stricter and stricter. Personally, that's not a path that I like. Right. Um, I think it's difficult enough to be a Jew. You don't have to go looking for ways to make it harder. And if I want to Im improve, you know, my uh, God consciousness, I use techniques other than just trying to make it stricter. I prefer using mindfulness and things like that. Right. So that's a whole yeah, that's a whole question. There are people like uh, Litvak, um, people from northeastern Europe, um, who. Have said like Nechama's brother, what's his name, Eliezer, um, who said like consciousness and feeling have nothing to do with it. Right. Like you do it because you do it. It's like you right. Know, Yisha Leibowitz said the same thing. He right. said he said that you know the you shouldn't think you're supposed to get anything out of prayer. The only thing you're supposed right. to get out of prayer is it's a mitzvah. You're doing the mitzvah because otherwise, how could it make any sense that the person who lost his his wife. Is saying the same same exact prayers right. as the person you know who's uh, celebrating the birth of a baby. It doesn't make any sense. So he says it's all right. just about uh, showing that you're you're in a relationship with God where you're commanded and you're fulfilling the mitzvot. Right. Personally, that doesn't make any sense to me either. But, right. Although you know what uh, Chaim uh, Kornberg says about um, it's easy to get attached to um, the epiphenomenon the the experience, the ecstasy, right, uh, and the consciousness, and then like, oh, I'm just in for the ecstasy, right? Which which is the wrong perspective. The, the, right. the Dalai Lama said the only reason he pursues enlightenment is because it'll make him more compassionate and he'll be able to serve other people better. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. And uh, 
I, I used that concept as well in a, in a sermon I gave about uh, Jacob's Ladder, right? So you have the angels going up and down. You know, why do we go up? Why do we, you know, well, yeah. if you go up, you get... Why bother? Then you have to you come down get, again. Yeah. You can get a different perspective. Yeah. And that perspective... Um, you know, you bring it back down here so that you can work to make things better down here, right? Like, that's a very common thing with people who travel into space. You know, they travel into space and they see, oh, in space, you can't see any of these borders. You can't see, yeah. you know, all these things. We, you know, and, and they sometimes feel that, you know, we're screwing things up, that we, yeah. need, to, uh, we need to do a better job. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a tricky thing, you know, but borders and nations identity but that's you know the root of our identity again you know if, if you want to be a person it uh you know in judaism we talk about uh chesed and gvura keeping right. a balance between right. having borders and um might and force and a simple kindness which is like merging with everybody and uh if you go to one extreme or the other you're, you're right you're, it's, it's you know. the same thing in our relationship with god we're supposed to have both Yira and ahava, awe or fear and and love. It's got to be both. Right. And the people that you know, is sort of the new age spiritualism, want it to you know all be ahava, right? Right. They want it should be all love, you know. But you also have people unless you're over thirty. You, you also have people yeah. who are like in the, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I think there are people in in the Jewish world where it's all about it's all about the all about, right worshiping right? the you know? worshiping the borders, right? So and, to speak. Uh, so. So the question is, uh, one question is, um, do you have a sense of uh, the, f and be so bold as to uh, presume that you have a sense of the flow of history, um, where we're going, are we going to, uh, the uh, Jewish texts speak about a time when uh, um, the majesty of this world, this world is, our, our level of uh, interaction with this world is raised to the point where we have a level of understanding where let's say we see god in everything and uh is that something and that there are people who experience that anyways you know like that, that, yeah. that's what we aspire to but yeah. we will we will never get to it right so 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 my view of the uh mashiach or the messiah mm -hmm. um and there one it's a fascinating subject because there, there there are views of the messiah in judaism that are 180 degrees out of phase with each other even just in the orthodox world, and there are multiple alone, messiahs also you know, joseph and other, david and other uh, realms but the uh, uh i like the approach and in, in luriana kabbalah they they basically say you know that it's our job to do tikkun olam how do we do tikkun olam we do mitzvot and, and in their scheme, and it doesn't matter whether it's a ritual commandment like lighting candles on Shabbos or an ethical commandment like giving charity to someone, doing mitzvot, brings a healing or repair to the world. And when we've done enough of that, the Messiah comes more or less as a graduation ceremony to say, Mazel Tov, you did it. You guys created this yeah. really good world. Right? Yeah. So I, so that, that's the approach I sort of like to say that... Uh -huh. You know the you know we we have to do the the hard work. It's not like we sit and pray and then when right. God's good and ready, some right. magician comes and fixes everything. Right, right. We have to do the work to make the world a uh, uh, a better place. Rabbi David Hartman, Zichron Olav Racha, said mm -hmm. the Messiah is not so much a prediction for the future as it is a critique of the present. So mm -hmm. the the idea of the Messiah and the uh, Yemot Hamashiach, the Messianic age is to give us a gold standard to aim for, something to strive for, something that we're, we're our goal, our target. And, right. and it's not something that we'll necessarily ever achieve, but we keep working towards it. Um, I had a, one of the most interesting classes I had in rabbinical school. I had a, a semester-long class just on messianism, and it was uh, the single most interesting class I had. It was taught by... Uh, Steve Lowenstein, Zichronol of Rachan, and at the end of the class, he said, the Messiah has to always be out in the future, because once the Messiah comes, the movie's over. Uh -huh. Well, so interestingly, um, there are people uh, you know, on, the, on the internet who say absolutely anything and everything, right. but one of them who was, happens to be a professor at... Um, at uh, one of the UC, uh, I think uh, Irvine, or, who has a lot of uh, uh, credibility, or at least until he said this, <laughs> he said 
that um, the time space paradigm has had its time, mm -hmm. and uh, and which is similar to what you know the poets, let's say Blake right. and uh, and the mystics like um, what's the guy from Italy who got uh, kicked, Luzzato, mm -hmm. who got kicked out and then reinstated. That at the end of this six thousand years period, that paradigm you know, and the problems of how do we which and some people say well that leads us into the issue of you know how are we going to visit um, uh, galaxies that are hundreds of thousands of light years away right <laughs> and um, is that the time space thing oh that was a useful paradigm it gets and then, now we're changing all the laws of physics and the, and now that well it's not changing it's just going to a uh, you know it's like going to another level <laughs> where there's uh, more refined laws like right. um, and they they already are well on their way to what uh, embracing what uh, Einstein called um, what is it called spooky um, action. spooky action at a distance spooky right. action at a right. distance right right where at one end of the universe one particle changes or one piece of information changes and at the other end of the universe the same particle or its twin right. uh, reverses and right. goes in the opposite direction yeah. so we're 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 getting ready for that and no. um, um, so. So the question, I, I, let's say, I mean, do you give any sort of credibility to the 6,000 year No, paradigm? zero. Zip, it, not it, a nothing. Because, you know, there have been so many movements that have come. And, and, and you know, we had them in Jewish history, too. They had times yeah. where they, they predicted, oh, right. we did the these Messiah. calculations. This is when the Messiah is supposed to right. come. The Messiah didn't come on that day. You right. Know? They, right. This is actually funny. I remember reading about this cult in the Philippines that predicted the world was going to end Davka on my birthday. <laughs> And then the world didn't end. What, what, I didn't. What, oh, right. That was what, we, what had, we had those. The, 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 yeah, the guy with the uh, with the placard walking around saying uh, it's the end of the, the world. The end is near. The end is near. So, yeah, so, so I, I you don't give any credibility. Now, here's the here's the thing. There's, but but yeah. if it's six thousand years, we only have two hundred and seventeen years to go. That's to right. Find so out. we'll find so. out. Yeah, we will find out. And if we go by this uh, futurist Kurzweil, then people who are already alive in our generation. Will be living t until then, yeah. Because the the curve of longevity will go to the vertical. Um, but um, the part of the thing is, like again, if we live and die by narratives, and my my father Allah Shalom, was also big on this. He said you know, he was a psychiatrist who who dabbled in mysticism in in this about what I'm going to say is he said that um, when pe the way people die. Um, it's, in a similar way as to the way people live, mm -hmm. it's it's an expression. It's mm -hmm. not just a random, you know, shift of the sands of of life or something. Right. It's a it's a real expression of who they were, what they were, and uh, sure. you know the vectors of their um, uh, of their will and energies. I've I've had the privilege, uh, you know, in my work as a rabbi, especially mm -hmm. of being with a number of people. At the time they pass, and I often feel like I'm a uh, midwife in reverse. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That I'm helping have, someone transition to a different to a state. different realm. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So if you so here's here's the thing. If you believe in different realms, that's apparently you do. Um, well, not, nece not necessarily in the same way you're thinking of it, but well, go ahead. Well, <laughs> some like there's a book written by a conservative rabbi also that does the soul survive. Right, Ellie Spitz. Uh, right. Yeah. You you were in school with him or something? I don't know. Yeah, Whatever. he was. I I I you know I knew him, him yeah. as a teacher. I I had Shabbat lunch with him at someone's house here right, in Jerusalem right. not too long ago. So. so so there is a textual basis for that stuff in in Yiddish type, but my my point is or my question is. And it seems also something that the physicists um, are always uh, speaking about. They say that 80% of the universe is dark matter, right. meaning and 80% of DNA they call uh, junk DNA because they, because in both in instances they have no clue or a very little clue of what it's about and what so, it means. So, so it turns yeah. out I, I just yeah. watched something uh, the other day about this junk DNA, and it turns out it's not junk. Uh, none of it. It, it, well, it was, was ninety. Kind of it point. was ninety-eight percent. They said only two percent of it actually oh, encodes it, proteins. We, yes. And ninety-eight percent they thought was junk. But it turns out the junk actually does important right. things in well, how things get activated and this and that. It's just we we didn't understand it. That's all. That I think is a. I mean, that's my presumption, and it's it's sort of like what people say about the text of um, of the Tanakh, mm -hmm. the text of the Bible. Um, is that every and even um, 
and even uh, yeah, Yishke, uh Jesus said, you know, about his oat and tittle, uh, his uh, jot and tittle ex uh, right. expression about, you know, somebody asks him, like, uh, are we responsible for the, you know, for the halacha, for Jewish law? And he said, because we see you're breaking the, shot, the Sabbath. And he says, uh, yeah, not, you were responsible for every jot and tittle, for right. every single detail right. of, the, of, the, of the law, and of, you know, of the, which means the Bible and, and, uh, and the prophets and all that. And, and there are times when you either need to change the law or the law right. allows for an exception. Right. But and, that's I'm, I'm, the, and, and that whole episode was a case where one could quite reasonably argue it was a reasonable exception, you know, that were well, other rabbis. No, who I might don't have think so. With and that's, that's kind of right. what I'm saying it's, is uh, that I'm saying that what's written in the DNA um, is like what exists in the world. Right. And uh, you can say that it, when uh, it exists in the mind of God and, and the, by definition, Anything that exists in the mind of God, anything that exists in the Bible, and the Bible that God looked into the Bible to create—that's the the midrash, is uh, to create the world—is that every detail is pertinent. Mm -hmm. So I would say, by definition, uh, and it makes it all the more powerful. Uh, you know what they call the cloud of unknowing, mm -hmm. is the fact that that you know and you know that you know such a small uh, bit, small percentage. Of, uh, of the nature of reality, right. whether it's the nature of DNA or the nature of the physical universe, um, is a powerful um, engine for us, mm -hmm. as you say, to keep us um, learning and, and, uh, and discovering. So, um, so, how did we get to that? <laughs> <laughs> we, we're, we're associating freely, but um, we talked about DNA, we talked about uh, dark matter, we talked about why make Aliyah. <laughs> we talked about why make Aliyah. Uh, anybody remember how we got to that? Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. It's That's just right. like it's just like studying Talmud, you know. The, That's right. You know, you can be in Masechet Shabbat and you're talking about all sorts yeah, of other things. Yeah, it'd be good. You know, what would be good, and this is a possibility. Is um, there's uh, in some of the podcast uh, systems you can see a simultaneous um, trans. Um, Text. Text, right. Yeah. So I would like to It'll do that. that, that then yeah. if, I, if I lose my train of thought, I can just, you know, scroll, scroll back scroll a little back. bit. What did I say <laughs> two minutes ago? Yeah, right. <laughs> and so we should, we should set that up. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, so, oh, I know what I was going to say, is that, um, ah, so if we're willing to embrace uh, the, the fact that we are unaware or unintelligent, let's say, about 80% of the universe, uh, in all of different dimensions, then, um, then, and and we're also willing to accept that we live our lives according to narratives, and that the strength of a narrative uh, is, uh, in great part, um, uh, defined by its uh, longevity its, and its liveliness, meaning its ability to reproduce itself. Which means that the Jewish story, or if you want, to, however you want to define it, the Jewish story is easy enough, um, has peculiar strength, peculiar longevity, peculiar ability to reproduce itself. Um, and um, and so and this so the six thousand years, you know, is something. You know, it's mm -hmm. like believing in I don't know. Whatever I don't know I can't think of an analogy, but I expect, I expect yeah. we're just gonna blow right past. We're gonna blow past. It's like the years two thousand. We expect it. No. <laughs> well, they say that's one of the one of the models for uh, post uh, messianic time. Is it's just like now, except uh, like Chaim Hornberg says, uh, except when somebody forgets their money on the bus, everybody's gonna run to. Um, to, to pay for their for pay for their ride, like people right. are going to be nicer and stuff. Well, there um, there is an opinion in the in the Talmud that says there's uh, no difference between these days and the days of the Messiah, other than we will no longer be subject to uh, foreign servitude. Right. Foreign and if servitude, you go and if right. you go by the, if you go by that opinion in the we're Talmud, already in that era. Uh, you know, yeah. Ben Gurion was the Messiah. Right. <laughs> well, that's what uh, what's his name uh, um, the, the Vilna Gaon, right? One of the great 
both both a mystics and he was on both sides of the fence right. at the same time. He was both a mystic and and a uh, you know a litvak, uh, you know a strict mm. a strict uh, halachist um, Jewish law person. And he said that um, using uh, numerology that the year 1948 was a, a, a peculiarly important year mm -hmm. uh, in in the evolution of the Messiah. And of course, that was the year of the founding of uh, right. the state of Israel, probably also the state of Nehemiah. Right. Yeah, right. So, um, beginning of the dawn of our redemption. Right, right. Okay. What I was going to say is um, what I, my approach to technology, and I know you're, you've been involved in technology, you've written a, a lot of about uh, a lot about technology, you've written for technology companies and for startup companies and. I started the company. Um, you started a company as well. <laughs> so I've always um, believed, uh, not always, I, at some point I began to believe that um, technology is a, um, uh, is a, a reflection of, um, of our own native abilities. Uh, like, that people really do, like the whole thing about in, in, uh, entanglement, re people really do, especially like twins, they really do have, uh, let's say, telepathy over a distance, mm. and uh, and great innovations really do uh, happen simultaneously in different parts of the world. Sure. And um, mm. so I've, I've I, always, I think it was Arthur Clarke who said sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Right. Or and from spirituality, mm -hmm. I would say. So and that's also, I think, the approach of the of the Rabbi of Lubavitch. I think he said. Like we're embracing, uh, he was, you know, there, as you said, there were, there were uh, halachic positions saying uh, anything new is, uh, is forbidden. And that was a problem to bring electricity into the, you know, into the synagogue, right. a problem to bring chairs when they were accustomed to sitting on, on benches. benches. <laughs> right. yeah. And so, um, um, so, but m my sense is that, um, and also, I think it's Kurzweil has that idea that kind of whatever spiritual, intellectual uh, ambitions we have uh, are hopefully ascending and becoming more coherent in line with our technological developments. Right, and that's one of our challenges. It's it's not just spiritual, but but social development is not keeping pace with with technology. You know, we we we've developed weapons that are capable of destroying the world before we've developed the moral sense not to have those weapons <laughs> exist. Um, yeah, well, who knows? I mean, do we really know? I mean, do we, because do we know? I mean, I listened to, uh, uh, what's her name, Magnus's history of, uh, like, the Temple Times, mm -hmm. and some of the stuff that was going on in the temples, I mean, as Jews, we hearken back to the time of the Temple as being you know, the time of, uh, like, an ideal time, you know, right? Yeah, no, read, but, read, read the book yeah, of Maccabees to find yeah, exactly. out the real Hanukkah story, There was right? some really it was, brutal... It was we were, corruption and violence and, and brutality. And yeah, right. Yeah. No. And so, so Stephen, I, I mean, Stephen, Stephen Pinsker wrote a book called The Angels of Our Better Nature, which, which right. is... Which uh, is, he says that... Which is worth reading, because he says we're making progress. It's, yeah. not, it's not a straight line... Yeah. You know, there are, there are occasions where we dip down, and right now I think we're in one of those dips as, you know, racism and misogyny and uh, homophobia and all other sorts of things are on the rise, not just in Israel, but in mm -hmm. other countries around the world, and mm -hmm. divisiveness is becoming more common. But the long-term trend is still positive. I mean, there's what less happens, murder, what, what's good, there's, there's less right. hunger. Your, your chances of dying a violent death are lower now than, than ever before. Um, despite the war going on in Ukraine, what makes that remarkable is it's an exception. What makes that remarkable is it's been 70 years since there was a real war like that in Europe, whereas prior to that, Europe never enjoyed 70 years of peace. Uh-huh, uh-huh, really? Yeah. Uh-huh. So, um, so there is progress. It's just not There is progress, line. yeah. I'm, I, I, I would hope there is. Uh, I don't, you know, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to get a... Uh, I mean, I trust this guy's, uh, he's probably a smart fellow, and uh, he, I'm sure he's using some sort of uh, semi-credible um, you know, standards to judge that. So it's probably true. No, but, but, um, we, but we are advancing. That's another thing that I, I think I have as a issue with the um, sort of orthodox approach to halakha, 
which is is to I, I think is characterized by excessive humility of saying, mm-hmm. you know, the rabbis longer ago were closer to Sinai, closer to the revelation at Mount Sinai, right. so therefore, you know, we're we're midgets compared with them, and we don't dare change anything right. that they put in place. Right. You know, whereas the truth is, look, now we've got resources like the Barilon database, which right. is just stunning. Uh-huh. Right. And and so it gives us capabilities. You know, like I'm in, you know, I, I read you read Rashi and you have to be in awe of his mind. Right. Yeah. And but now we can supplement our minds with technology right. and and have be able to access, you know, sources that we wouldn't necessarily think about in the particular context because we have this uh Right. Uh, online stuff that can help us, you know, find things. And I think if we don't, uh, we talked about this a little earlier, but I, I think if we don't adapt the halakha to the times that we live in and the needs of our times, mm-hmm. we're, we're both not doing our job and we endanger Judaism. Because I think the right. only thing that's kept Judaism alive is that we've been able to adapt and adjust and 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 mold our narrative a little bit so that, right. so that it fits. But there was also... Uh, as uh, David Frankel gave a talk about um, um, some of the censorship, like part of the thing was the censorship of, like when some uh, some rabbi's text would get printed and it had what you know half naked figures and the people would come in and they would you know color right. in and put right. pay us on the on the maidens <laughs> in the in, in the, uh, but um, so it's all yeah it's also you know, redefining borders redefining. Uh, Identity is a is a part of uh, continuity, and right. it's, it's setting one's limits is a necessary part. The development and uh, growth and reproduction is is also so. But if you if that's another thing, if you want to judge, I mean, I hate to be so direct about it, but um, if you want to judge, um, you know, vitality. As I said, one of the one of the one of the measures of vitality is the ability to reproduce. Mm-hmm. And um, and uh, Chabad has been you know reproducing you know in you know in uh, in a, a very strong way, and uh, I think the, I've heard that the majority of synagogues in America are now Chabad or, or yeah, and conservatism. Uh, I don't know what the figures are, but I've you know the rumor is that it's. Um, it's uh, it's not in its in a, in a no it's shrinking but, it's but that shrinking. but that yeah. that reflects changes in society right because in society sure. being in the middle is no longer a good place to be everybody's becoming right. more extreme you're either you know rejected the, out the, hand, you know yeah. the Republicans and Democrats have been moving apart right, right? doing things on a bipartisan basis is right. is like a thing of the past and right. it's the same way in the religious world so people right. are gravitating either towards orthodox or reform yeah you know because that middle of the road which is a little squishier a little bit more ill yeah, yeah which for me is the exact right place to be well on the other hand like you know the if you think of the model of like you say motors of change yeah you know like the, the motor of change and getting back to the Seinfeld story one of the motors of change is difference you know and um that was popular in the you know, when I was studying literature, right. it's like the idea of difference. But, but see, I, 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 I would not hang too much on, you know, the ability to reproduce as being, you know, the, sign the, of the vitality. ultimate or the sign of success or the sign or, or the goal. Right. I mean, the no. COVID virus reproduces really well. Does that make it a good thing? Well, that's it no. makes it. It makes it. <laughs> that's it. That's a whole question. It's I mean, vital, it's, but I don't. It's, think it is it's, vital. It's I'm not saying, a, good or bad is another question. Well, and but, I think religion gets called on to answer good or bad questions. And I would say it's a bad thing. It killed uh, a lot of people. Uh, um, OK, so oh, getting, you know, picking up a picking up a level. Um, do you do you uh, feel or think that the, there's an overall, um, I, I sort of asked this before, but I'm asking it again, an overall direction? Is there, is there a guiding uh, force which, um, which is in control, um, which is bringing uh, all of history? Uh, I mean, I would like to say that it's, w- without dismissing the, uh, the, the idea of, uh, that humanity is a full partner, let's say, mm-hmm. uh, in, the, in the process, but do you uh, feel or sense that we're heading towards, uh, you know, what is it, the great, you know, the, the emptiness of, uh, you know, the, of, of nothing? Uh, 
or that we're heading towards um, a sort of redemption, a sort of where all of our um, nonsense it, it sort of gets gets highlighted, and the and the world as it is, or as it can be, gets highlighted in uh, let's say a godly light. I mean, people do have an experience of godliness. Right. I I don't think of it as any external force that's pushing us in one direction or an or internal another, right? force. Right. So I'm not uh, inherent I'm force. Not, yeah. uh, I, I personally intrinsic. Don't, I personally don't subscribe to the notion of hashkacha pratit where. Nope. You know, everything that happens is because, you know, God has willed it to be that way. I, I, I'm a big believer in free will. Yeah. As, yeah but, and, and, and so with free will, it's really kind of up to us if we're going to bring about those messianic days, if we're going to create right. a better world. And uh -huh. I think the jury's out. I don't know. We're, uh -huh. you know, we're doing some good things. And we're also mm -hmm. missing the mark on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. But... Right. You know, I think do you have advice? For, that's uh, our that's our mission. You know, we have to go out there and do that work and strive to make the the world a better place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think our generation is one that, you know, sadly is in many ways leaving the world in, in worse condition for our descendants than was handed to us. Mm -hmm. We we had a, we had a relatively easy ride. Right. In terms of Where the growing economy and, the 60s and, and, you know, mm -hmm. things going well and all that sort of stuff. And now we've got now we understand what's happening with climate change. We, you, you can't avoid it anymore. It's becoming ever more obvious. Um, and and income inequality is becoming so bad. There, there are a lot of things that, you know, where we're, you look at the, the younger generation, you know, kids in their you know, say late twenties and thirties have a much harder time, you know, getting meaningful work and a solid career and stuff like that. You know, because yeah, you think so? what what? Oh yeah, yeah. Because Be industry. Uh, yeah, you know the the middle class has been hollowed out, right? Uh -huh. So you have, you know, again this polarization, right? Uh, instead of a factory where you got two hundred good paying blue collar jobs, you've got you know, a dozen highly paid engineers and right. a couple of dozen very poorly paid schleppers and right. the middle is missing. Right. Um, and so, uh, and there's more of the schleppers than there are of the engineers. That, that's just America so, and Canada, but in, I don't know, maybe it's in Europe as well, but like the rest of the world is, I, I don't think they were less polarized um, in history than they are now. You know, there were kings yeah. and there were slaves and right. all through history. Right. Uh, but, but a lot of things I think are, there are things that are getting worse. Uh, there's also signs of hope. You know, technology can help a lot of things and so on. But, you know, the, the social stuff uh, isn't, isn't quite keeping up. Mm -hmm. and, and do you have, like, uh, you know, we talked earlier about, um, um, or actually I was speaking with Bitsalel about uh, everything's determined except, um, everything's determined except, um, fear of heaven. Fear of heaven, right? And fear of heaven as being this one little uh, window into window window into eternity right. um, that uh, is um, animated or energized or occupied by one's will. Right, but see, I don't I don't think it's all determined. You know, if it's all determined, why bother doing anything? Oh no, because right. you have this window into so. eternity that ins that can inspire you to. To change things, to be an engine of, of of good, whether or not it's predetermined, whether or not there's, you know, whether or not you're a simulation, you know, we're a simulation, or whether, you know, it's a play that's already been written. Right. Um, you know, we don't have the ability or necessarily the desire to be able to know that. But and it's maybe, but the the fact is that even in that in that um, the way that that's drawn out. We still have this one window, um, which uh, one of the poets, uh, Blake, says that every day has a window into eternity. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you can go further and you, the idea is to expand that so you have more of those moments uh, during the course of the day. And eventually to expand that where, um, where your godly creative powers, you know, what are they, your, one of your wives uh, was a was a feedback person. So what is it, the theta waves? Mm -hmm. Where your godly uh, theta waves, your ability to be both spontaneous and creative and compassionate all at once, are uh, take up most of your day, Yeah. right? So um, 
so it's it's a possibility it's 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 just something that um that we have to um understand as a desirable goal and uh and focus on it um and the fact that this well anyways i don't know uh, no but, but yeah. that, that, that's similar to uh uh what uh Harold Kushner said with the with the problem of evil, you know, that yeah, you know, when it when a kid gets cancer, it's not because God decreed it. Right? It's because yeah. you know, and Rambam says the same thing. It's because the world God created the world made of stuff, and with a world created of stuff, things like this happen occasionally. Where you see the presence of God is not in the cancer, but in the you know the people helping to cure it, and the nurses, and the doctors, yeah. mm -hmm. and the, the support, of, and that's being godly. That's manifesting God. Right. That's that's but, making God imminent, bringing God's presence into the right. world. But people, a, a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people. A lot of people who have publicly come out to say that the, you know Shiloh that uh, that their cancer was like the best thing that happened to them. It opened up a perspective. Some into the people value. say that, and there were also but, people but, who who didn't who like having cancer that. at all. That's Maureen, most Maureen, of them. When right. Maureen, I think it was Maureen Marks in L.A. Yeah. She was a writer for the Jewish Journal in L.A. You know, yeah. she had cancer. She said, "I don't, I don't want to find meaning in my cancer. Right. I, I just mean. want it to go right. away." Right. It, 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 it harkens back to that same question of, you know, is there such a thing as uh, junk DNA? Is there such a thing as dark matter? And the answer is yes, because we because our consciousness is limited, right? And our awareness is limited, and our science is limited. So I'm I'm a I'm a strong believer in Gamzula Tova. This too for the best. That, okay. So you know, you, you, yeah. you look you look for the positive and uh, and and, and, and I mean there are people that all the physicists, uh, especially this guy Neil Tyson, is fond of saying you know we are stardust, and Gerald Schroeder you know says you know we are stardust. So, and the same, in other words, the same elements that we're made out of, physically made out of, are the elements of the Big Bang. And whatever origin story there is for the universe is inherent in us. You know, and as uh, the Renaissance people used to say, like, the, and the Jews have said, is that the whole universe is within us. Right. Right? right? So, oh, and, that, and that's my view of God. God's, for me, God's presence permeates everything. You know, it, it, me, you. The so, table, everything. Right. But and all time, then, right. if you would have to say all time, all time as well, and all time as well, right? Which and which includes evil. You see, this is right. what, when it goes back to our my imagined discussion with you. I think we real discussion that mm -hmm. um, you know that evil and disease and all bad things are also also have imminence. Uh, would you would you say that? I feel like I'm putting you on trial. No, they're here, you know. The, yeah. You know, if God is in everything, God right. is also in the stuff we don't like. But right. I don't, but I don't right. view it as God is some separate entity no, deciding yeah, to inflict not. cancer and on that's, a fortune. No, no, absolutely kid. not. And that's so. in fact that was the whole thing of uh, um, that was kind of the the problem with the uh, golden calf, right? Right. Is that the the point was that it was supposed to be God among us and right. within us. Right. And that we did this whole thing, as uh, Chaim says. I'm sorry, I keep referring to Chaim, but he's my, my main conduit of uh, <laughs> awareness of, uh, of of Judaism, Yiddishkeit. That um, the problem, one of the problems was um, that we became uh, in love with the epiphenomenon, with the ecstasy. Right. And but that was like a major mistake. Right. Building them, even though uh, Aaron was uh, complicit, apparently. Yeah. Um, and that, but until, and that led into the whole, uh, the whole temple practice and the right. need to build a temple and the need to have it externalized. But before that, the origin, original goal was to have God imminent and God's original goal was to have him, himself imminent within us and right. among us. So, so the, yeah. you're, you're saying that, you know, we're all stardust reminded me of a joke. So it's about time for a joke. So we had time for a joke. Been very, very serious conversation. So it's uh, Yom Kippur, right? And, Yom, yeah. and uh, we have the the part in the service where we prostrate ourselves fully on the on the floor, and so come to this part in the service, and the uh, you know rabbi is just so into his prayers, and he's moved as he prostrates, says, oh, "I am nothing but dust and ashes," and gets up, and then you know the the candor is moved by that, and. You know, he's all worked up and he 
bows down, prostrates, and I am nothing but dust and ashes. And then a little while later, you know, they look and there's this guy in the back who also, you know, prostrates himself and, you know, says, I am nothing but dust and ashes. And the rabbi says to the cantor, look who thinks he's nothing but dust and ashes. Right, right. <laughs> can, can, that's, that's right. That's like um, the Jewish humor. Like, what's the deal? Like, you know what Robin Williams said about Jewish humor? No way. Um, so uh, uh, he, he says he was on, he was being interviewed by the German television. And I can't imitate a German accent, but uh, the interviewer said, Robin, why do you think the Germans uh, don't have such a strong tradition of humor like America does? And uh, Robin said, maybe because you killed all the funny people. <laughs> <laughs> so, <that's, laughs> yeah. and, uh, and there are a lot of um, like amazing punchlines that are um, on the wall of uh, a Jew one of the Jewish community center in, in London. Another one is, I should I won't give the pen. I'll tell the joke. <laughs> okay. So this woman was on a um, on a cruise with her grandson, and uh, a big wave comes or with a wind and blows him overboard, just like Jonah. And she says, "God, if you if you bring him back, I'll start observing practice, halachic practice. I'll just start doing mitzvot." And the next wave comes, and there he is. And she says, uh, excuse me, he had a hat. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and then another one that's on the wall, I think, is, uh, uh, oh, yeah, uh, these Jewish grandmothers were, uh, is, is this feeding anti-Semitism? Maybe. <laughs> uh, is uh, their Jewish grandmothers were being served in Florida because there's in Florida there are a lot of older Jews there. My Jewish grandmother, uh, Jewish you know, lived there? lived there until she died. My so. Jewish grandmother lived in was in Venice and used to go to the Venice school before it became the Venice school. And uh, so the waiter comes to this table of Jewish grandmother. They have like early dinners there, you know, and it's like five bucks for all you can eat. Yep. Uh, all the Jewish grandmothers are there and the Jewish grandfathers, more Jewish grandmothers. And so the waiter came and said, um, is anything okay? Uh, oh, yeah, the food is terrible and the portions are so small. No, is anything, you're supposed to ask, is everything okay? He said, is anything okay? Okay. Anyway, so humor, um, uh, humor is an important part of, uh, of the Jewish experience. Absolutely. And what do you think about this guy, Cain? Uh, uh, um, he's a you know, anti-Semitism in America is like on the rise. Is that right. good for the Jews or bad for the Jews? You know, little anti-Semitism has always been good for the Jews, yeah. right? It, uh, it, it's always increased, um, you know, as Jewish sense of solidarity. Unfortunately, the anti-Semitism in the states, contrary to the headlines, is relatively mild. I oh, mean, really? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you don't. I mean, some idiot, yeah. you know, says things on you know, on Twitter or whatever, who right. cares, right? It doesn't... The Jews are in control really of the right. of the entertainment system. Right. Yeah, okay, you right. know, fine. But, and then somebody uh, gave an... Yeah, but, but you asked, you know, why are there so many Jews in, yeah, in Hollywood? He could, he could have you said know, that, because, yeah. because they weren't, they weren't they, allowed to do it in weren't New York. Allowed to, and why, why are all the big, uh, uh, what used to be white shoe uh, Wall Street law firms run by Jews now. Yeah. And why, oh, why, and why are there big Jewish uh, law firms? Because right. during the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, they were not allowed into the white shoe Wall right. Street firms. Absolutely. And so they had to start had their to own start firms. Their own. Yeah. Right. So, and that's how they got into, into banking also, because they weren't allowed into the guilds of all the other professions. Right. But they were allowed to be uh, money lenders. They weren't allowed because, to own land. And that always, and, yeah. Uh, so, so what, again, so the place of evil in our history, in the place of oppression in our history, it seems like, uh, and we, we almost celebrate it uh, during Pesach. We're like, yeah, they always try to destroy us, and they fail. Right, look, that's the, and, you know, that, and, that's the story of the Jewish holidays, right? They tried yeah. to kill us, we won, let's eat. Right. right. Borum, Hanukkah, you name it. <laughs> yeah. So... Do you have any suggestions for people who are who might consider Aliyah, or do need, do people need to consider hal Aliyah from a halachi point of view? Well, so in in the world of halacha, there's there's a debate about whether making Aliyah is, a, is an actual commandment or not. 
right? It's not included in everyone's list of 613 commandments, right? We all know that we have 613 commandments, but a lot of people don't know is there's no agreement on what the 613 are, right? Well, there's Doc no agreement Monides, about anything. Except, Maimonides yeah, right. and Maimonides have right. different opinions. Right. One says it is, one says it isn't. Um, the uh, uh, Moshe Feinstein said that Aliyah was an optional mitzvah. Uh, what's an optional mitzvah? It's like, like uh, wearing a talus. Right? There's no requirement to ever put on a talus. There's a requirement that if you put on a garment that has four corners, it has to have fringes. It has to have tzitzit. Right. And so we put a talus on to right. demonstrate that we're right. eager to do right. even this optional mitzvah. So even if, therefore, making aliyah is an optional mitzvah, why aren't you more eager about you know doing it? Uh, personally, I think it, it probably is an actual mitzvah, not just an optional mitzvah to make mm -hmm. aliyah. Mm -hmm. But I also think there's nothing wrong with being a, a dual citizen. Uh, right. You go know, back and the, forth. You know, go back and forth. Which like is, the angels go up and down. Which is what, yeah. you know, when I'm not doing interim rabbi work, I, I spend, you know, part of the year here and part of the year in states and part of the year in my RV. And the uh, and I think that's fine. But we, we all have this connection um, to Israel. And I gave a, uh, before we made Aliyah, my last uh, high holidays when I was in Toledo, I gave a sermon, and one of the things I said was, um, every Jew should at least think about Aliyah. And if you if you decide yeah. not to make Aliyah, that's mm -hmm. fine. But at least mm -hmm. you know you know why you're not making Aliyah. You've at least considered it. And that's the only sermon I've ever get, given where I actually got not an email, but an actual physical letter complaining. You know, uh -huh. From someone said, America has been very good to the Jews, and yeah, right da, 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 as if it's a separate know. issue. Right as if the Jews, whereas in Jewish. Um, uh, tradition, Jewish literature, um, Torah, uh, and the people, the Jews, and the land, are equated. Right. It's or, or they're married, or they're or they're equal, or they're so. But but I'd love to see a lot more. You know, people making uh, aliyah, uh, yeah. whether they stay, you know, for three years or stay forever or go back and forth. Right. Uh, because it is. Like I said earlier, the most exciting thing to happen to the Jewish people in 2,000 years. Right. And it's it's so desperately important that we get it right. Because if we don't get it right, uh -huh, it's just got to uh -huh. be destroyed again. And right. it's too important to leave it to other people. We all have to contribute to it. And especially, I think, people from North America and, and Europe have a lot to uh, contribute. Right. We, right. Understand, a lot of right. we understand how democracies really should work. You know, we, 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 we have a certain mindset towards things like, you know, uh, rights of minorities and protecting the environment and things like that, that Israel really desperately needs. And, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so we need, we need reinforcements uh, of people with those values coming here. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, I mean, just to, to, to say another question, like I listened to... Um, um, Micha Goodman's, yeah. some of his book, and he keeps talking about um, the, um, you know, having a majority of Jews, and that, because some people say that the Arabs living in Israel are reproducing, again, the question right. of reproduction, quicker than uh, the Jews, and if we annex them, if we bring them into our, our land, first of all, uh, you know, uh, that they might have a, uh, a majority eventually. Um, he, he eventually um, dismisses the question. He's left, he calls it a catch, the name of the book is Catch 67, like right. Catch 32, because there's an internal contradiction that can't be resolved, which is that that the, the Palestinians have refused um, serious uh, public offers in front of presidents of the United States repeatedly to have their own land um, because it involved allowing the existence of uh, a land for the Jews as well. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you don't do that, so you can't, you know, there's really nothing more to talk about. But uh, the, one of my uh, pet subjects, it, it comes into, not a pet, it's, I don't know, it's more important than, well, pets, the, these days in America are as important as children, mm -hmm. at least in some places. Um, so is the question of how many of the Palestinians how many of the people of the world 
uh, were Jews or are Jews, according to some definition. Mm -hmm. You know, if you uh, like, uh, and um, you can tell me what you think about this. Some people say that there was paternal descent. At least the Reform the Jews say that paternal descent was um, was what defined a Jew in biblical times, and then at some point it turned over to maternal descent because there were a bunch of um, uh, pogroms and rapes and stuff, and right. you couldn't tell who the father was, so we turned it over to maternal descent. But and if you if you adopt both of those, um, then like you know two thirds of the world or some enormous number uh, is is Jewish. And then, but to be uh, more, ask a more practical question, one which I've had, uh, and you actually you have a story about as well, uh, the number of times I've heard that a lot of the, uh, the first place I heard it was from a geneticist. He said that the Palestinian Arabs are not our cousins. We frequently refer to them as our cousins here. Mm -hmm. And he says, they're not our cousins, they're us. Right. We're genetically not distinct right. from the, our, the local Arabs. Right. No, I know. Right. I, I know a Palestinian guy who says, uh, in in his family, they believe they're descended from Bar Kokhba. Really? Right. Yeah. Right. He lives in. He's a Palestinian living in Hebron. Near right. Hebron. Right. Yeah. I've heard there's a some high tech person. We I think uh, Bitsalo knows who he is. Who did a bunch of research. And there's a whole there's a, a village near Hebron where they all say, yeah, we're Jews and we're not going to convert because we know we're Jews. But yet I don't know how they relate to Arabs in their community. And I've had that experience, like, because uh, I kept hearing stories, so I keep asking people. I said um, to a taxi driver who I could see on Get that it was an Arab, I said, um, I heard that a lot of the Palestinians uh, were Jews at one point. And he said, nonsense. And then, mm -hmm. like, 40 seconds later, he said, well, actually, my great grandmother back in Morocco was Jewish. <laughs> and then she married a, a Muslim, and then my grandmother married a Muslim, and this is on my right. mother's side, right. and which makes him halakhically Jewish by the, by the strictest uh, standards. But not by the reform standards. Not by the reform, <laughs> or the conservative standards. Or by the reform, go only by, only by the reform. Conservative would still say that he, that he'd, he'd But be reform Jewish. say only paternity, or what? No, they, they say it doesn't matter which parent is Jewish as long as you were raised Jewish. They oh, say seriously? The important thing is being raised wow. Jewish. Wow, interesting. For them, that's the issue. Is being raised Jewish. Raised Jewish. Uh -huh. Well, that's also when making Aliyah to Israel, that's one of the things that they check out. They right. want to see your parents' uh, ketubah, your uh, right. Jewish marriage contract. They want a letter from a, your local rabbi to say that you had some sort of a, uh, cons consistent interaction. Right, but you know, the, the, the truth is we're such a, a melting pot in Israel. We're, we're, we're a little bit of everything. I mean, you have, yeah. you have Jews who are basically genetically identical to the Palestinians. You have... You know, Jews who went to Europe, the Palestinians were Jews who stayed and converted to, you know, be uh, to uh, Islam. Uh, but then you also have, uh, you know, people in the local population among the Jews who came from Poland and stuff. And, right. you know, and, and, and we were very much like, you know, the people in Poland. I mean, a Polish Jew looks different than a Persian Jew. Why? Right. Yeah, clearly, right. there was some intermarriage with the local populations and they look more like the people from... Right. Where and they came from, but there were also Arabs who came, you know, after uh, the first wave of Aliyah because the economy was improving. So we also have Arabs who came from other places. So we have people who've been here for a long time, people right. who came from other places. Uh, it's just a, you know, a real, uh, uh, right. a real mix, a little right. bit of everything. Yeah, and and just one one kind of um, parting comment. That's one of the things about Micha uh, Micha Goodman's book. Is he refers to? He keeps referring. Mean, it's the funny thing, the interesting thing, and valuable thing about his book, is that he presents both sides in such a way that it's like, well, obviously that's the valid position, right? And then you read the other one. Oh yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, too. yeah. Right. He presents both sides in that way. So <laughs> on one of his forays into um, into one of the sides, he he says um, he talks about the Nachba, mm -hmm. which is uh, which is the, and he talks about that as their, you know. Their, their historic moment, which right. is their most defining moment, which was, and I'm going to say supposedly, because there's many differences of opinion, uh, supposedly uh, they were kicked out. Um, the, the, uh, most of the Israeli, uh, Israelis believed that they weren't kicked out, that the Arabs themselves told each other to leave because there's no, a war. I, I think the evidence is pretty clear. 
Um, it's a little of all of the above. Exactly. Many of them were, right. actually were kicked out. Uh, there's no denying many of them were physically evicted and forced out. Okay. They, they, I, I haven't so heard somebody, that. Oh, the, the, the archives have been opened, the state archives yeah. okay. from, from that no, time. I have heard that they fired and guns. I just heard, like, the other day on YouTube, some, some uh, in, guy who said that they were, you know, they were scaring them. Uh, they were shooting guns. On right, them. they're shooting guns in the air. Right, they, but, but they were also places where, where they ordered them to leave. Right, okay. and it was, I, I haven't it heard was that. In a, but it, when, it was an explicit policy of Bavarian. Yeah. So it's a question of what the percentages are. Of right, the how question many, is what the percentages what, were. But, was but, it 5%, but, 10%, 20 30 40 whatever it was. It, it existed. I'm sure it existed. Just yeah. as in every army, even though I think Israel is by far, uh, without question, or maybe the only ethical army uh, in the world, you know, who invented the idea of informing a building that they're going to be bombing it, right. or and um, and and and, uh, and holding us to task for all sorts of things if if we kill a prisoner or whatever. So, and they're becoming more more self, uh, you know, such self judgmental. Um, so, what was the point? <laughs> uh, the, 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 so uh, the, uh, the point is that the Nachba, and oh, so one of the, as I, I don't take taxis a lot, but when I do, I always make a point of asking the question. Mm -hmm. And um, and this guy said, well, I have a story for you. And I got his phone number so I can bring him in for an interview. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> it's, um, he said, well, I was here uh, during, I don't know, I guess if, if he was 48, he must be pretty old by now. So it doesn't seem like he was in his 80s, which would, that, right. that would be how old he is. Uh, yeah, he was 80, so maybe it wasn't. But at least during one of the, maybe during 67 also, um, there were, um, you know, Jordan owned the territories, right. including the old city of Jerusalem. Right. And uh, the Arabs told each other, apparently, um, to leave and, uh, and not come back. And so he uh, was a kid then, and he left. And then, he, but his father decided to stay in the old city. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then after a while, like days after the war, a week after the war was over, um, his father said, "Come on back. The water's fine." Yeah. And uh, so he and his mother, his siblings, came back. And also, and within a couple of days after that, they were loudspeakers in the old city saying, if you want Israeli citizenship, come to this building, mm -hmm. you know, so which gives the, you know, tells a different story than I'm sure you can hear in other places. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I'm sure there are, you know, there are, uh, there are, there are certainly stories of, um, and one of the crazy stories is um, Dari Yassin, right. which is uh, it, it was supposedly one of the battles of one of the, which, call, which is called like one of the massacres, right. um, turns out to be one of these villages where the roots of the villagers, uh, as indicated by the mezuzot, places for the mezuzot on mm -hmm. the door and some of uh, Magane David on the buildings, mm -hmm. was one that had been or remained a Jewish village and that somehow they did conversion, which is, you know, and, and that's not one of the things just to jump before I forget, um, and there was there were also conversions in biblical times, sure, uh, and even in uh, New Testament pre uh, like a hundred years before the New Testament before the, the year zero, um, where um, it was a political thing where they went up and converted all the people in the north of Israel to Judaism for political reasons because they wanted to make it. You know, that's one way of explaining right. under the Hasmoneans, they did forced conversions of domains. Right. And it turns out, and the, Jody Magnus points this out controversially, she says, and in fact, that's the area in northern Israel uh, that Jesus came from, the Yeshua came from. And so he, his family may have been among those who were, you know, converted for political reasons. It doesn't, which doesn't matter, but I'm just saying... And also we have the Kuzari, also uh, right. the whole thing, which the story of mass conversions by a by a king in the Middle Ages. Yeah. So, it's anyways. So, All anyways, right. let's wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, we have enough segments to uh, <laughs> to drive a lot of crazy people crazier. There you go. <laughs> All the best. Thanks. Thanks. And. Uh,
Yeah, it's been yeah. fun. Okay. And, uh, so you want to get back? Yeah, and maybe I'll be in shape. I'll either get my hip done or won't get it done. Or <laughs> Maybe they'll be in a mission. Yeah, you re- but moving's important. You know, you really moving need is to... Moving I know, I know. You really yeah. need to move. Whether, yeah. you know, and just do whatever you can. Whether it's, you know, a little short ride on the Missy La or, or yeah. go for a walk or whatever. But moving is... Is important. The is body critical. was made for movement. Designed to move. Yeah, okay. I'll try to... Keep it moving, Neil. Keep it moving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you.